Well, this is an actual question. Show of hands. Um, how many of you have been lost in the last year? Got some brave guys. Wow, this is not going the way that I thought it was going to go. We actually have more men lost than women. <sighs> I don't know what to do with that. Usually it's the other way around. Usually the women that are getting lost and the guys go, no, I was just taking a creative route, right, to get there. Uh, I was lost in Charlotte one time with some uh, men and... Uh, we didn't have a map and this was pre-GPS days and there was a good restaurant that we were trying to get to. And we actually circled the restaurant for an hour before one of the weaker ones insisted on rolling the window down and asking someone. And, and what we decided was this was kind of like a, a caveman type exercise where the caveman would surround the prey, you know, and get the perimeter uh, decided and then gradually move in on the prey. And that's what we, you know, we're going back to caveman times. But getting lost is something that I really, I've gotten my family lost in some great places, haven't I? Yeah, when the kids were small... You know, it's like uh, one time we were in Belleville, Illinois, and headed to St. Louis, and I took a creative route through East St. Louis. <laughs> and that was an experience that we all remember, you know, uh, going through a pretty rough part of town there in East St. Louis, and it's probably good for us. But uh, I, I have a way of doing that, you know. Now we've got GPS, and that has just solved everything because... Except when the GPS is wrong. Have you ever had GPS go wrong? I've got, I've got a theory on that. I think that someplace there's this nerd sitting in front of a computer that does all these GPS, uh, what, what do they call them? Coordinates. No, that wasn't what I was going for, but I should never ask a congregation a question like that. <laughs> but, you know, they're doing all this GPS stuff, and they go, they, they go oh, he wants to go to uh, 415 uh, South Marshall. Well, nobody's going there. That's where my ex is, you know. So, so nobody gets to go to that coordinate, you know. And, and they're just laughing at people who put in some places because nobody's ever going to go there. That's, that's my theory. We're finishing our series on the kingdom of God as a party, and that's why there's balloons around the place, and it was RSVP, God sends us his invitation, and he invites everybody. Everybody's invited to the party of the kingdom of God. And remember, the kingdom of God, kind of my paraphrase translation is, what that means is, this is the world as God intended it to be, and this is what God wants to invite us into. And today, we're going to come to just one uh, chapter in the Bible, it's dedicated to one theme. The entire chapter, it's, um, the theme is lost, as Tom has already amply introduced for us today in song and, and also in his uh, introduction. Uh, and this is on, if, if, if you don't have your own Bible and you want to look at it, I will put most of it up on the screen here, but it's on page 797 in those Bibles. And it's Luke 15. We call this a lost chapter. There are three stories or parables here about being lost. First, there's sheep that's lost. Then there's a coin that's lost. Then there's some boys that get lost. Now, usually Jesus told a parable in response to a question that somebody else asked or some kind of situation that arose. And, and this is given in response to some Pharisees and some scribes. And these two groups are very important. Scribes were the legal lawyers, church lawyers, and our Jewish church lawyers. And the Pharisees, we know, were these highly religious guys that had it all together. And, man, they, they cared so intently about it. And they were like the super, you know, fundamentalists of the day, if we can go there. And, and that's who the Pharisees were. And, and neither one of them liked Jesus much because he broke all the rules all the time. But we start off here with the context, and that's Luke 15, 1 to 2. And it says, All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I, I like the word grumbling. Uh, another translation says murmuring. Um, in our day and age, we'd say, well, they were just saying, 
right? We all just say things. Well, we, we've even had that a couple times already this morning. Somebody is just saying something, you know. You know, the Pharisees are going, well, he might be the Messiah. He's done some unbelievable things. But, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that I, I'm not sure he is because uh, he's, uh, he sure could pick better friends. Just saying, you know. And that's, that's kind of the way, you know, getting back to that. And just a little grumble, a little murmur, just a little complaint, just a comment, just a side comment here on the side, just, just saying. And uh, that was their problem. Um, doesn't seem like too much to us. He's eating with sinners. Now, when it says sinners, this doesn't mean the guy that lost his temper with his wife last night, or the man that ate all the chips and the kids didn't get any. We're not talking about that kind of sin. This is big sin. These are professional sinners. <laughs> I didn't think it was going to be that funny. These are people that sin for a living. Okay, now you can kind of fill in the blanks there about who these people were. You know, the Bible is gracious and it doesn't say anything. But that's who these were. They're professional sinners. And Jesus ate with them. And I mean, in their day, that's huge. Eating with somebody was much more than what it is now. Today, if you want to have a business arrangement and you really want to land the deal, you take them out for a power lunch, right? And you take them some fancy place and you feed them and you get, it's much more intimate. We know that. But back then, when they ate with someone, it wasn't just a power lunch. It was all night. I mean, this is Mideastern type or, or Oriental type meals where they would recline at table, literally kind of lay down on the ground and just eat and eat and course after course. And it was this huge thing. And if you wanted to make an alliance, if you wanted to form a new community, then what you did was you had a dinner and this dinner kind of changed everything. So Jesus eats with the sinners and the tax collectors. And, of course, the tax collectors are the traitors of Egypt because they've sold out to Rome. And that's who he, he hangs with. And Jesus is building this, this new community, and everyone's invited. And uh, some, like the Pharisees, refused the invitation because everybody was invited. And they didn't want to sit down with these kind of people. They didn't want to have dinner all night with these kind of people. Now, here's the question that we're going to be asking today is how does God's grace change us as a community? And the first thing that we see is that the community that Jesus forms is a community of lost people. Um, when I was a, a young Christian, um, I s saw a bumper sticker. Remember this? I had it on my back of my pickup truck, and it said, If you are lost, I know the way. Yeah, I was that guy. You know, <laughs> if, if you would pull in behind me now and I had a bumper sticker that said, if you're lost, I know the way you think. There goes another religious nut. That's, that's me. That's Don the religious nut. If you're lost, okay, I'll, I can show you the way. So here we are, Luke 15, uh, the first parable, Luke 15, 3 to 7. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had a hundred sheep and lost one of them. Now, you know, most of the time, we have nice feelings about this idea of us being sheep and God being a shepherd. It, it sounds warm and kind of fuzzy to us, you know. Really, it's kind of a um, spiritual insult. Um, Isaiah 53, 6 says, like, all of us, like sheep, have wandered away, each going his own way. And, you know, sheep may look cool. And they may look, you know, much better than goats, right? Rather be sheep than goats. And they look kind of cool, but sheep are really dumb. Did you know that sheep are dumb? See, most people who have never been around sheep don't know that sheep are really the, some of the dumbest, stupid animals there are. Um, possums make fun of sheep. You, you probably didn't know that, but they do. They make fun of, possum is above sheep in the mental capacity. Cats have jokes about sheep. They really do. They, you know, like there's two sheep that walk into a, a bar. You know, that's the kind of joke that a cat would, 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 uh, would tell. They're just dumb. They're, they're totally defenseless. Sheep can't do anything. You know, God gave all the other animals some means of, of defending themselves, like running fast. Sheep can't run that fast, right? Or some animals will puff themselves up and act real big. 
Sheep can't do that. Sheep can't fight each other. How, well, what are they going to do? You know. So here's their defensive mechanism: is they flock together into a herd. Flock. They herd together. They herd together. Strike that out. <laughs> they herd together. And you stop and think about that. I mean, there's their defensive mechanism. They're saying, if the wolves come, get in the middle, because they'll be full before they get to us in the middle. That's the kind of person that a sheep is, okay? So how do you feel about yourselves now being God's sheep, right? Uh, it's not a compliment. And I brought, brought this card figure. Um, I got this when I was... In, in Israel, and I really, it's really neat. I'm thinking about leaving it on the communion table for a period of time here because it's carved out of olive wood uh, from Israel and shows Jesus carrying the sheep. And it's just a, such a kind of a pastoral comforting figure to see that. And you'll see some more of that as we go through the day to see how Jesus carries us. Um, we love that idea. Jesus you know, carrying us on his shoulder. The reality is, is that in order to be able to do that, uh, the shepherd has to search for the sheep. Once he finds him, has to get the sheep down on the ground, probably tie his legs up, and then put him on his shoulder. And, you know, he can't just lead him back because sheep are kind of like leading cats. You just can't do that. So he has to literally carry him, and they just kind of wander around all the time. Um, and when we see this figure, we, we realize that, that God has found us and God has uh, perhaps knocked us down. And perhaps even God has tied us up in some way and now is in the process of carrying us back. So I just wanted you to know that, uh, that when he calls you sheep, you know, bah, we're, that's who we are. We're kind of helpless, defensive and sometimes kind of silly, stupid animals that are prone to wandering away. That's how sheep do that. Uh, we wander as, as human beings by trying to find some nourishment for ourselves, trying to feed our souls with something and with many different things. And we might pursue wealth because we think, well, that's, you know, if I had more, then I would be okay. And I, I would feel like I was somebody and I was successful. And so we throw our lives into that, you know, and the next thing you know, the kids are out of the house. And there we are with the big house to clean and maybe a mate that we don't know. And we go, how did I get here? I, I was going after something that was going to help. And how did I get to this point in life? Well, we just kind of put our heads down and go. We just kind of, you know, day by day wander in that direction, just like sheep would after, after grass. Or, or maybe we see a person and we think, well, she's, she's going to fill this in me. He, he's going to make this right in me. Okay? And so my soul's empty. So I pursue this person and I'm relentless and I put my head down and that's, that's just it. That's all I can see is this one person. And then, you know, when that crashes... We go, how did I get over here? I don't even remember deciding to go here. And we realized that, you know, for months or years that this was all I was pursuing because I thought this is what's going to make my soul whole. This is what's going to make my soul well. So we're kind of like sheep. This fits people well. We wander away trying to find something or someone that will make us feel like we're somebody, uh, like we're okay, uh, like we're needed. And unless that search is for God than the one who made us and the only one who truly loves us, then we wander away and we get lost. But you see, Jesus, Jesus is there with the sinners and the tax collectors, and he's forming this new community of lost people. Now listen to the rest of the parable. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the, in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is thrilled and places it on his shoulders. See, there's our image. And when he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Celebrate with me, because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. Joy over one sheep, one, one, one person, you know, 
who changes their hearts and lives. That's the joy of God. That's the mission. Now, the next parable is something lost, too. It's in Luke 15, 8 to 10. And let me read that for us. Jesus goes on. He says, Or what woman, if she owns ten silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp, sweep the house, searching her home carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Celebrate with me, because I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. Again, the theme is this joy that, that, of finding and returning the, th the one that's lost. And Jesus is forming this, this new group, this new community of lost sheep and lost coins. And then we get to the third story, and we all know this one so well. But the third story is lost children who find their way home. Luke 15, 11 to 32. Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the inheritance. Then the father divided his estate between them. Soon afterward, the younger son gathered everything together and took a trip to a land far away. There he wasted his wealth through extravagant living. When he had used up his resources, a severe food shortage arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. He longed to eat his fill from what the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. Now, that's about as lost as a young Jewish man can be. I don't think we realize, uh, and I know that you've heard this, this before. He's lost, his friends are gone, his money's gone. <laughs> And all he can do is survive by eating with the pigs. I mean, now that, guys, is the bottom. It doesn't get any lower than this, to be eating with the pigs if you're a young Jewish boy. And Jesus is saying that he's forming this new community with people who are lost, who wander away. And we're forming this new world, this kingdom, with those who have hit bottom. And a community composed of people who, in trying to feed their own souls, have put their heads down and, and wandered away into a place where they don't want to be. But it's not just lost people. This community is made up of people who are infinitely valued by God. These are the treasures of God. You see, the one sheep that's wandered, the, the coin that's, that's lost, the son that's lost. We are the sheep. And God leaves the 99 to go look for us. And the woman in the house turns everything upside down. And the, the one boy returns home. The next part of the parable is one of my favorite parts in the whole Bible. I'm sure it is for a lot of you as well. It's very emotional. Uh, when I started planning this out, I didn't think of it being on Father's Day. But it, it has even richer implications for Father's Day. Um, because he comes to his senses. Verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough food, but I'm starving to death. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Take me on as one of your hired hands. So he got up and went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion. His father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. What imagery that is. I mean, that just, you can see that. Can't you see that in your mind of this whole scene? The father sees him while he's a long ways off. The father's watching for the son to come home. He's looking. And the father runs to him. The, the old man runs to the son. I, you know, I know how hard that is, you know. To, to do that. And, and he hugs him. And it's not just this little man pat thing that guys do. This is a big bear hug. Isn't that the way you see this? He just grabs him. And oh, it's, he thought his son was dead. And now he's back. And he kisses him. Wow. That's, that's a picture of just how much God the Father, you know, loves us and is watching for us and loves the lost sons and daughters. The son doesn't get any words out before the father hugs and kisses him. The son 
He's practiced this confession as to what he's going to tell him. He's got everything worked out as to the excuses and, and how, not really excuses, but, but to beg for mercy from him. He's going to, he isn't going to ask to be a son like us. We think that we've done something seriously wrong. We think, well, I can't return back in the same place where I was. I think I'm out a little bit, but, you know, he, he just wants to be just one of the servants, just to work, get paid. He doesn't expect to be a son anymore. And then there's this other issue in this of being unclean. Most of the time we don't see this here. Uh, if you were a Jew, and you know they had all this, all these, um, all this holiness law that's in Leviticus about who they could be around, and Jews couldn't eat with Gentiles. Gentiles, uh, Gentiles, that's everybody else that's not a Jew, okay? Gentiles had cooties, they had Gentile cooties, and you couldn't eat with them. And if you were around them or touched them, before you could go back to temple, you had to go through all this ceremonial cleaning and everything. And if you touched somebody who wasn't clean, then you couldn't go to temple. The father doesn't care. The son's got pig stink all over him. And the father just gives him this big hug and kisses him because he doesn't care if he's ceremonially clean or not. The father doesn't care if he can't go to temple for months because his son's home. We are the treasures of God. Later, Paul in, in Romans 5, 8 would say, God shows his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We, we could talk all day and never exhaust that subject of how important that is. That God dies for us. God loves us while we're sinners. Not, not while we've tried to clean the whole thing up and look real good. Um, you don't clean up to go home to God. You go home dirty because God knows the dirt. It's okay to him. You, you can never clean yourself up enough to not need God's grace. Do you hear me? You can never clean yourself up enough to not need God's grace. He'll clean you up. You just present yourself and he'll, he'll clean you up. First, first, we need to know the embrace of God. We need to know God's love for us. We need, we need to sit in that and feel that and let it sink deep into our hearts to know that God loves me, period. And then when we know that embrace, when we know that acceptance, then the cleanup begins. So this community that Jesus is forming is a community of people who've, who've gotten lost. They're also a community of people who are infinitely valued. God loves them beyond measure. And you can't separate these two things. These two things are linked together. And this is, this, they, they, you can't separate them. If you can't separate that you are lost from you being valued. If, if you think that you are lost but not valued, then you're going to live just in a bunch of continual guilt. Okay, I'm just so lost. I'm so bad. But the opposite's also true. If you think that you're valued by God, but you're not lost, then what you end up doing is trying to make your life so, you know, it looks good and it's acceptable and trying to earn God's favor, all these religious things. But we have to have both, a sense of being lost and a real knowledge of just how much God values us in our lost state. Now, the next thing is, is the community is composed of people who are committed to inviting outsiders in. Lost people um, attract other lost people. Did you notice that each of these parables that ends in a party? I like that. We're on a party theme here. It ends in a party, each one of them. The shepherd finds one lost sheep. He says, let's party. The lady finds a lost coin. She says, come on, neighbors, let's party. Look at what the father does for the son. We go on here, verse 21, chapter 15. Then his son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. See, there's, there's how he had reconciled things. The father said to his servants, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Fetch the fattened calf and slaughter it. We must celebrate with feasting because this son of mine was dead and he has come back to life. He was lost and is, is, and is found and they began to celebrate. They have a party. Kingdom of God is a party. It's a huge celebration. There's rejoicing, it says, in the presence of God by the angels over one sinner who turns. And Jesus says, I was just up there. Saw that all the time. 
<laughs> Let me tell you, they're having parties up there all the time, the angels are, because they really get with it when one sinner turns around and heads for God. The angels just throw this huge bash. Guys, just up there. Let's do that here. What if the church was like that? You know, it's instead kind of what we do is we go, oh, did you hear what he did? Did you see what she did? Let's document all that down. God's like, mm -hmm. kill the fatted calf, get out the robe, put the ring on his finger. Let us celebrate. Okay, it's, it's, it's not about shame. It's about joy. It's about God's grace. The greatest joy is when someone from the outside comes in. Now, as we come to the end of this, we remember that only the lost get found. There, there's, there's a lot of people that are really, really lost, and they don't even know that they're lost. When I was lost, I did not know that I was lost until I got found. And all of a sudden, where in the world have I been? What have I been doing to myself once you get lost, once you get found? But you've got to realize that, that you were lost sometime, and then you're really found. Barry Zito, here's a baseball story for you, and it's not about the Cardinals. Are the Reds? Are the Cubs? Okay. It's, it's kind of, just a little bit. Barry Zito was uh, one of the best pitchers in baseball, dominating pitcher in the major leagues. 2010, um, he really hit his lowest point. He, he uh, lost his spot on the pitching rotation, removed from the team. Next season, he was plagued by injuries. But just two years later, 2012, he's back at the peak of his performance again. And um, he paid played a, a really huge role in the World Series uh, where they beat the St. Louis Cardinals. And one of the, some, you know, they beat the Cincinnati Reds, too. Uh, they didn't beat the Cubs. The Cubs quit real early in the year. But, but anyway, no reason to make enemies, is there? No, right. He's a Cubs fan. What can I, what can I move on? Oh, right, thanks, Tom. Yeah, heard that someplace before. 2012. Zito explained how God had used his suffering to get his attention. And you know a lot of sports stories, they're, they're a little light. I, I really thought that this one is great because he said, this is how I came to the point that I made Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. He says, sometimes you have to go through difficulty and physical trials to really get broken down. In 2011, I got broken down physically as well as mentally. In August of that year, I came off the field that day after never being hurt in 11 years. And I said, all right, something bigger is going on here. A message is being sent, and I've got to listen. A few months later, I realized I'd been doing it alone. My best friend told me an old story I really love. He said, a shepherd will be leading his sheep, and one of the sheep will be walking astray from the pack. The shepherd will take his rod and break the sheep's leg, and the sheep will have to rely on the shepherd to get better. But once that leg is completely healed, that, she that sheep never leaves the side of the shepherd again. He says, that's really a beautiful metaphor. A lot of things happen to us as people, and we realize that we've been relying on our own strength for too long. Last September, I got a tattoo, and it's the only one I have, of a golden calf on the inside of my right bicep. I show people that. And it signifies idolatry, that I was putting things before God. And Barry continues, he says, I haven't talked much about this. When I committed my, my life to Christ to the chaplain, he said, you don't need to go around telling people this stuff. There will come a time and a place. I guess that's a change in me too. I used to kind of dig attention. Now I'm seeking something deeper. I thought that was a wonderful story. That, that God sometimes allows our legs to be broken so he can carry us for a while. Well, you know, in the news all the time, we, we see stuff about how um, somebody has wandered off. Right now they're searching for a young man that they think was uh, chasing tornadoes there last week, and they can't find him. And, and we'll launch huge searches, and we'll go out in the forest, and, you know, they walk every square inch looking for little girls and for little boys because they become lost. And it struck me uh, this week in thinking about this whole theme that, you know, there's a lot of us that are lost that nobody forms a search committee to find us. You know, we're, we're lost as we're driving in traffic or lost as we're sitting at our desk or lost as we're at home. And we're really just as lost as some other people, maybe in a more serious way. 
than, than being physically lost. It's just not obvious. And the reality is, is that is, you know, just every day. It's just not reported. And we remember again that like sheep, we all go astray. We all put our heads down and walk directions which we really never intended to go to that place. And Jesus says, remember, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He is the path. No matter uh, where we are, he says, I'm the one that's looking for the lost. I want you to chew on that today as we go through the rest of our service, as we come to communion. Um, is there some place in your life where you've gone that you didn't really intend to go there? You're not sure how you got there. You're ready to come home. Um, or maybe you're just looking at life and saying, I just, I just don't like this. I don't like the way things are right now. Um, hear the word of God to you today. God has more for you than that. That is not why he made you. That is not why he's put you where you are. God has so much more in life for you than that. He loves lost people. He, he leaves the 99 to look for the one. He turns the house upside down. He's standing at the gate waiting for you to return. And he's got a fattened calf and a ring and sandals and a robe for you. Let's have a party. Let's pray together. As deep cries out